to see a band like Paramore who started out as these little kids, like these teenagers that were opening up for our bands, to see them up there on a level that felt like I was watching fucking Phil Collins or something. Like, you know what I mean? Like all, all these extra musicians, all this insane production, these amazing hits, like timeless hits in front of 50,000 people or whatever. And Nick said to me, he's like, dude, that's us. This is us. Like, this is our scene. Our little dirty, sweaty, warp tour punk rock scene is, is this now. I appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. Right on. I'm Adam also, so. <laughs> Good name. <laughs> yeah, Good name. exactly. Solid name. Um, and this is a podcast about you and uh, your journey in music, and we'll talk about the new album. Awesome. Taylor, man. Um, it's funny, I was listening to the podcast that you guys do, um, and it, it was like the origin story of the band, and that's kind of what our podcast is about, is the, the origin story of the band, but also we'll talk about the new album. Um, so I was just, it was interesting to hear kind of you guys just go off about it. Nice. Yeah. It's, um, that it was one of the first episodes, right? The, I think it was uh, the, the very first one. It, it was just called nice. the origin story. I was like, oh, okay, killer. I'm going to check this one. Out. Nice. Yeah. We were all, uh, just so hyped at that point to like hang out and talk, you know, beginning of COVID shit. So yeah, I was going to say that good. was like early 2020 when the, the episode came out. Yeah. Good energy. Yeah. Nice. Are you guys still doing it? We, we've taken a hiatus from it now that everything else is ramping back up, you know? Oh, yeah, of course. You guys have got to be so, busy. So. You know, social media is all full of shots from live shows and videos. We've got the new album, so the focus has kind of shifted. For so sure. We'll, we'll do it kind of like periodically when we feel like we need to to get one in. And we got, you know, some stuff here and there. We owe, owe patrons a few episodes and stuff like that. So <laughs> Right That's on, fine. man. Taylor, so um, yeah, I always start off born and raised. Are you from uh, St. Louis as well? Like, uh, were you born and raised there? Yeah, all of us. We're we're all from like North County, St. Louis. All from overlapping scenes and kind of friend groups and whatnot. You know, we were playing together in bands before Story of the Year. We kind of coalesced into Story of the Year once we all, you know, reached the point where a lot of up and coming bands do, where you kind of pick the folks that best fit or are most likely to actually like go for it. Right. So yeah. Um, high school friends, basically all of us. Wow. So you all, and then you, did you all go to high school together or just part of the scene within the same age group kind of, um, the other three dudes went to most of high school together. Dan went to a different high school to start and I went to a different high school, but we were all playing shows while we were still in high school in different bands. So we we've known each other since we were like 15, 16, 17 years old. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. So do you come from a musical household at all? Yes and no. I mean, my mom raised me on music, you know, classic rock, like uh, a lot of like hard rock, like early, like pre-metal stuff, like um, Deep Purple and yeah. Sabbath, you know, and Zeppelin, Clapton, the Beatles, you know, getting more into like classic rock and other stuff and, and all of that. She played piano. There was always a piano in the house, but I never learned to play it you know, which is mm -hmm. strange. It, it was <laughs> always out of tune as well. So that didn't help. But uh, <laughs> she definitely supported anything I wanted to do in music, whether it was going to concerts, being a fan, or, you know, eventually getting a guitar, which is the first instrument I played. And then shows and everything. I mean, she, she was fully on my team, even though my dad was skeptical kind of from day one, like, sure, how much time are you going to spend on this? You know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, Despite that, though, I, I did come to music kind of late. Like, I didn't get a guitar until I was 16. Oh, wow. I just turned 16. So, like, D Dan was playing in, you know, like, church and stuff, you know, when he was, like, 11, 12 years old, you know? So, right. a little different. But um, nonetheless, we all, like, from a very young age, knew that's exactly what we wanted to do. So... That's awesome. Yeah. So at 16 is when you got the guitar. Were you going to shows? Were you kind of part of that scene before you started playing? I wasn't into like a, a local scene yet. And I, I hadn't gone to many small shows, you know, like my first show was Paul McCartney in a stadium. Oh, there you go. You know? <laughs> and then it was like, you know, four or five amphitheater shows in a row. Like I think Aerosmith, Metallica, Pantera. Damn. You know, stuff like that. Like just big stuff. Yeah. And then it wasn't until, I guess, around like 
junior year, I started going to smaller shows. Like once I discovered new metal and like kind of really found my own scene, like mm-hmm. my, the, the first music that I knew as my own was big stuff like Metallica, Guns N' Roses, whatever. But when, you know, I think it was right around 95 when Deftones and Korn came out mm-hmm. and I got really into new metal, we started going to smaller shows at like, you know, 250, 500 capacity clubs seeing bands like that incubus at the time who was still really small um like snot you know oh, yeah. uh, new metal bands like that and i was like damn i want to do this you know like the go- the goal for most of us like in our our little group in high school was to play this one venue in st louis called the galaxy which we okay. saw where we saw all of our favorite you know new metal bands hardcore bands and stuff like that it's like a 500 capacity club and we did that like within a year we did wow you know? so then the next goal was to you know play the the bigger venue which was it you know now gone also it was like eight hundred thousand capacity and we were we were like hitting those milestones which is like bizarre when i think about it now because we were so terrible but uh <laughs> you know we we quickly became part of the scene i guess is is the the short answer all right and you because you're in another band prior to the story you, the year you said you guys kind of like formed up as you yeah. picked people from other bands was it story of the year that first ended up playing like galaxy and all those other bigger venues or was it your other band before that it was the other band before that oh we, wow and like even like our i think it was our second show first or second show with my old band the dudes from what would become story of the year the old big blue monkey prior mm-hmm. to big blue monkey i don't know if you've ever heard that name but yeah, yeah, I, um, I've, and then they were something before that, like something sixty-seven or sixty-seven oh. North. Yeah, yeah, I think sixty-seven North. There it is. We had a mutual friend who said, "Hey, you should come see this band." Talking about us, and she brought. I th- I know Ryan was there. Uh, the old singer Big Blue Monkey was there. This dude John Taylor and uh, the bass player Perry West at the time. Uh, they came to see us, and Ryan was like, "Dude, you guys are awesome. We have a band, like, you know, like a new metal band, like you guys, and we." we like jump around and do cool stuff too. Like we should play shows together. And, you know, just, <laughs> you know, such nerdy, like high school kids. So we sure. became friends right away, played shows together quickly. And then, you know, like I said, when it came time, when people started, it, it was kind of like shit or get off the pot kind of thing with, with the band, like we're doing this or you're not in it anymore. So quit if. <laughs> right, if right. Yeah. It. It's like, Hey, this is what we want to do. We're going to tour. This is, we're, we're going to take this very seriously. So if you're not going to, yeah. If you're not on board, then just get out now so we don't have to waste our time. Exactly. And that's what the old bass player decided was like, okay, well, I don't think I want to go that hard and, and really revolve my life around it. So he quit. And I, at the time, was a guitar player. Mm-hmm. I wasn't even an active guitar player. I, I played guitar, but I was like rapping in this terrible band. Um, oh, are you, so you're the vocalist? Because I... I, I when was I was listening the to day. the origin story episode of that podcast, um, you guys were talking about your band, which was called yeah. Low Cash, correct? Yeah. And then somebody, it's hard to tell who who spoke who is speaking just because it's you know audio audio, yeah, yeah. audio only. And uh, somebody talked about the song. I wrote it down because then I looked it up. Uh, oh, the song Focus. They're like, yeah. oh, the song Focus was a jam. So then I found it on YouTube. No, there's like way. a recording. Yeah, there's like a record. Is oh, it shit. maybe I'm listening to the wrong thing? Is there's like a face of a dude and it's like yeah, yeah, he's like pulling it. stuff down and there's like lines going up. Yeah. And I checked it out. I was like, damn, this is pretty cool. Like <laughs> it, so that was you on the vocals. I thought you were just a guitar player in the band. Yeah, that was it was just that band, we were such a shit show and we were such <laughs> terrible songwriters and we were so delusional about what we could do, like so naive. Which uh-huh. worked to our advantage sometimes. I was gonna but. say it, you, it didn't sound bad though. I heard that one and I listened to another one that kind of like flew up. It was like that was like song six on the record because I wanted to hear what it was because that yeah. was the one that got called out and then it went into the next one and it sounds good. I mean, it was like it sounds like it, a good new metal band from that time period. I mean, we were definitely doing the the new metal thing, but it's, <laughs> it was one of those songs that like we went into to the studio like like I said just naively like yeah let's just start recording, spending all this money and we had certain songs that didn't even have vocals on the verse <laughs> or didn't even have like a chorus. You know, we were but which now is whatever it's, you know, you get in pro tools and you, you just, you build it as you go. But back in the day, according to tape, like 
everything analog, nothing automated, nothing, I mean, like none of the modern tools were like, oh, let's just go record. So in the studio, we had no verse. And I was like, uh, I can maybe do something. <laughs> and I did that verse. And then that led to me becoming like the second singer instead of playing guitar singer. I like, that's a really generous title. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I became this, like, bad Fred Durst kind of thing eventually. <laughs> and then our other singer was, like, full Jamie Josta hate breed style. It was a really okay. weird combination. Um, but nonetheless, I, I, I was, like, you know, I was down with just, like, assuming whatever role in the band was needed and just learning and trying to figure out how to be that person, be the vocalist, be the guitar player or whatever. Or in the mm -hmm. case of Big Blue Monkey, which would become Story of the Year, becoming the bass player. I remember I heard that their bass player quit and I was working at uh, this Emo's pizza place, Emo with an I, uh, in St. Louis. And I remember vividly saying to my girlfriend, I could play bass. I could probably play bass. I should try to play bass. Like just assuming like, yeah, I'll just join the band. <laughs> you know, again, being <laughs> I, and uh, I don't think I even, I don't think I even asked them. I don't know if we even had a real conversation other than like, oh, I heard Perry quit. Mm -hmm. And then I was at the grocery store with my ex-girlfriend and I get a page on my pager. Nice. Because it was 1999. <laughs> yeah. From uh, Ryan or Dan, one of the two, and called them back on a payphone. I was going to be like, then you got to find a phone. You're like, oh, yeah. shit. Okay, somebody needs to get a hold of me. <laughs> Let me go yeah. find some change in a phone. And they asked me to join the band and play bass. I, I didn't own a bass. I didn't have a bass amp. I had never actually played bass other than just like to pick up our bass player's bass and dick around, you know? Yeah. But that's how it started. So in, in the beginning, in rehearsal, I, I did get a bass like right away. And mm -hmm. I, I used the old bass player's amp once. And then he, you know, came and showed up, okay. took, his, took his gear. <laughs> so the next rehearsal, the next like, half dozen rehearsals probably i just played without an amp and just just jumped up and down and just like just to get the vibe you know what i mean yeah because i was that much on board and we were that into it that it didn't matter you know that's awesome wow so we're in the beginning you must have just because i feel like a lot of people that play guitar and they get thrown in. there's not a lot of people that start on bass and are just there at base i mean there are but it's a, ra a rare you know person to stumble upon that's like a really good just like i just only play bass bass player yeah and especially i mean early on right so if you could play guitar a lot of people are like oh i'll just play the root note you know kind of thing exactly. of the it, that's but that's so cool that you just wanted to be a part of it so much that you were like i don't care i'll play whatever as long yeah. as i get to do it because even guitar when i started that wasn't my first choice for an instrument you know like my best friend that i grew up with we were like oh we should start a band and it came it came down to like who could get an instrument first <laughs> you know so he got drums first and i was like well fuck i guess i'm not playing drums oh so um, you wanted to be a drummer yeah okay i had like you know sticks and a practice pad at the very beginning <laughs> and then he got you know a pawn shop drum set so i was like i guess i'll try to be james hetfield you know i'll get a guitar <laughs> And that's the way it went down. So it's not like I ever had a, a distinct preference for an instrument other than drums. So it was kind of like, yeah, guitar sounds fun. Yeah, bass sounds doable. Cool. You know, it was more about like writing songs, playing shows, having fun with my friends than anything, you know? Yeah. That's, did you ever get a drum set? Or like, do you play drums at all now or no? We, as a band, bought uh, an electronic drum set when we were trying to make the second album and josh just didn't play it he just never he never liked it so uh -huh. i took it home so for a few years i had that in my basement but oh, i've never awesome. owned real drums ever okay oh, yeah, my uh during when covid started i have he's turning seven on friday or saturday sunday maybe um but he, he when covid first started he just had all this energy my son and we bought him an electric drum set i'm like okay he, he nice. can just bang on these and not drive the neighbors like insane and yeah. he's been playing him and yeah it's definitely a different feel than i don't play drums i mean i could play just like a beat just like a standard right. beats but yeah it's a lot different on the 
on that thing versus like a kit. So I can imagine your drummer being like, yeah, I'm over this thing. <laughs> yeah, he's he's always been very particular about his setup and his equipment and all that kind of stuff. So we had that thing in the back lounge of the bus for months and months. And everyone else in the band played it but him. <laughs> like at any given moment, you go in the back lounge and one of us would be, you know, we'd have our iPod plugged into it and just playing songs. Jam into something. That's so yeah. funny. <laughs> So with the, the band starting, I mean, you were Big Blue Monkey before Story of the Year. And so you joined the band as a bass player. And how long, like at that point, were you guys like, were they drawing a pretty good crowd? Like, I mean, what was kind of the next step for the band? Like, when did it take it to the next level? It sounded like the guy left because he didn't want to do it yeah. as like a full-time thing. Like. I would imagine, so. yeah, you'd have to kind of start building a fan base and getting a little validation before you're like, all right, let's take this on the road. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. How did it all start? It moved pretty rapidly because they did have a pretty good fan base going because they were, to me at least, and to the other dudes in my band and some friends, the one band that everyone was kind of chasing. Okay. And part of it was because the singer was so good you know in the days of new metal there were so many shitty rappers and shitty like non-singing vocalists doing weird like half-assed jonathan davis type bullshit yeah. you know just like bad impressions like you know like in the days of like coal chamber and stuff like that where anybody could just like try to make some weird sounds with their mouth and that qualified as a vocalist somehow right. and no shade to any of like the bands like like corn is you know they're yeah, an incredible massive. band yeah. They're uh they're very talented, but everyone who tried to copy corn <laughs> everyone, most people didn't understand like what was going on and we were just we were just all embarrassing ourselves. So to see a band like Big Blue Monkey who had a great singer, this dude who grew up on R and B and could just like rip like boys to men and shit like that mm -hmm. in this hardcore band was like mind blowing for us. So we were all like, these dudes are going to do something. They're going to get signed. They're going to make it, you know, whatever mm -hmm. make it meant then what it means now. Um, so their fan base grew quickly. And when I joined, I came in with all this energy. So everything just sped up, you know, Ryan and I went immediately into like, you know, video and making uh making home video stuff making music videos doing all this shit it just it just really like picked up the pace and it quickly became apparent that the old singer wasn't going to work and dan who's always played every instrument always been a good singer turned out to be a great singer he's mm -hmm. like well shit i can sing and you know, we'll get josh to play drums because josh was in another band that ryan was in back in the day they were good friends and we brought it to our old singer as like, we had this plan that we would offer the idea of he and Dan be, both being singers. Cause that was again, a thing that people were doing in the late nineties. Yeah. Um, and Josh would play drums and the plan was either he will say yes and we'll have two great singers that are slightly different or he'll say no and we'll have one great singer. And we'll just be a normal man. You right. know? So he said, I'll try it. That lasted for a few weeks. And he said, I can't do this. And we said, okay. And, we and that was it. it yeah. So it was, so no matter what Dan was taking over on vocals, it sounds like like, okay, yeah. he's going to sing. And if you want to be a part of it, you can. Exactly. And then, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So from that point, we, we essentially became story of the year. We had a different name, but things really started to ramp up. We recorded some new stuff and we were sending it around to labels, you know, sending like old school press kits in an envelope with the CD, all that shit. Oh, and the photo and all that, and the little yeah, bio exactly. and all that the stuff. Okay. 10, glossy, all, the, all that shit. <laughs> and uh, we, we even went as far as to Ryan and I drove to Southern California to hand deliver a bunch of these, which is insane. Cause you can't just walk into a record label, but we, we're just again naive well, and motivated. Yeah, I was kids. Say, you don't know it that, especially back then. I mean, it wasn't like you could just look at their social media account or whatever. Even like right. the internet was still kind of struggling at that Decent, point. Yeah. yeah. So, and and we were also from a town that had no industry, so we didn't know that shit. You know, uh -huh. it's not like kids from 
New York, Chicago, or LA that have exposure to uh, the actual industry that have some kind of knowledge. We were just naive and again, like motivated. So we went there and dropped off a bunch of stuff here and there, but we also, I'm pretty sure it was like, it was a holiday weekend mm -hmm. and we were so stupid. We didn't even think that they might be closed for more than just the holiday itself. You know, <laughs> you know, we had no concept of like the extended weekend, especially in, in music and entertainment where, you know, essentially from like Thanksgiving to the second week of January, no one is available anywhere. You know, that kind right. Of right. Were you guys in high school? So at this point, or uh, you got no, we were, we were 21. Okay. 20, 21 years old. So old enough to go do whatever the hell we wanted, but young enough to be stupid as shit. And okay. <laughs> yeah 21 i mean early 20s yeah. still I mean, yeah. especially that early so you drive out to to la or southern california yeah and we i remember driving up to warner vividly and seeing zero cars in the parking lot <laughs> pulling on the door it's locked um and i don't i don't actually remember who all ended up getting those press kits i think we may have just left them on like the doorstep of some places mm-hmm but uh, we met with a couple of people and decided we should move there because things in St. Louis were, were reaching a point where we didn't know how much further we could go or how much more progress we could make. So rather than abandon our scene, it was like, okay, well, we have our scene and we'll return to that, but let's move and start a following in another scene. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to move to Southern California and Orange County was the place that made the most sense because we had friends who were already there, some friends from St. Louis. <clears throat> and it was quite a bit cheaper than LA proper as well. So Yeah. I'm from San Diego. So okay, well, I, I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So we moved to um to Westminster, you know, just outside okay. of Orange, like little Saigon. Moved to a three bedroom house, eight of us all together. Oh, damn. So five band members, uh, because we also, I mean, right before this was about to happen, recruited this dude, Greg, who was in another band that we had played shows with, another really good band who had an actual singer. Um, and he just said, yeah, I'm down to move in three months. You know, he was like that kind of guy, same kind of energy. So he, we moved out as a five piece along with, one of our best friends, this dude, John Oaks, who became our tour manager and then co-manager. And, you know, he's, he's been doing, you know, he's been in the music industry since then. So he came up with us as kind of our sixth member. And then, um, Dan's girlfriend at the time, you know, now wife of 15, 20 years, whatever it's been. Mm -hmm. And one other person eventually, um, a dude, a friend of Greg's who became a close friend who moved. So again, three bedroom house, Ryan and I are in bunk beds that we built <laughs> from sh with shit from Home Depot in one room, uh, Josh and Greg in another one with a bunk bed that Greg brought along, um, two, <laughs> two queen beds in the master bedroom. So there were like, you know, three, I guess three people in there. And then our friend, uh, Nick moved out into the sunroom in, and lived in a jacuzzi. <laughs> like, like an empty jacuzzi? <laughs> empty jacuzzi. He put blankets and foam and shit around it and made it this, and put a tent over it, an actual like pup <laughs> tent, and lived in there. And we just fucking went for it, you know, just started playing any show we could. And it's funny that within a couple months of being there, things started to happen that had nothing to do with being there. So like right before we left, we played the big radio festival in St. Louis called Point Fest mm -hmm. and Goldfinger was playing. We knew John Feldman had done the used and, and messed and we were all big Goldfinger fans. So we gave him our VHS promo tape, which was- Oh, you met him at the, that festival? Cause you guys yeah. were playing and Goldfinger was playing, got yeah. it. Yeah, and we, we opened, we like won the contest to open. So, you know, like, you know, side stage right at the entrance as the doors were opening kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we ripped. It was amazing. But um, <laughs> obviously, John Feldman didn't watch us. So we went around with these tapes and gave them to everybody. He got two or three of them, I think. And it was like, it was like, you know, 
everything that a band would put on TikTok now made into like a 12 minute video, mm -hmm. including like a little monologue about how we're so hardworking and all this really embarrassing shit. Um, so we, we handed those out. He, we gave him one at the signing. Uh, Greg actually like went and found their bus, just opened the door and just put it in there, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And I guess they watched it because we, you know, once we were in Orange County for a few months, all of a sudden we get a call to our, our, to John Oaks, our manager, you know, um, then six band member, sure. Unofficial manager, you know, it looked good on, on the thing to, of course, like yeah. Um, he, he got a call from Goldfinger's, I guess, booking agent or manager and said, Hey, we want to bring the band out for a couple weeks of shows if you guys are down and we said, of course. And it was the kind of thing where Feldman, because he was an A&R for Maverick at the time and he was producing and he was looking for bands, he would bring bands out for a week of shows, see how they did, get to know them and, and just kind of suss it out. So that's what happened with us. And that, you know, week or so of shows turned into, I think a month because it was going well, we were killing. And he said, I want to put you on some more shows. And in the meantime, we were kind of talking about songs, talking about maybe getting together and, and working on some things. And then that just all fell in place. And then we did Warp Tour on the most like janky, like early days, hack the system type stage. Mm -hmm. Like a friend of ours who had a label, very generous air quotes, uh, use of the word label, just bought like a sponsorship slot on Warp to have a 10 by 10 tent. And instead of like selling merch there or something, we built a stage that was 10 by 10 out of, again, Home Depot wood, put the tent on top of it, and we would play shows there all day, you know, like half a dozen bands. Wow. So between that and the Goldfinger thing, neither of which had anything to do with being in Orange County, stuff started to happen because Warped was great for us. And we just hustled all day, backpacks full of CDs and headphones and disc, disc man, like, you know, yeah. Non-consensual, uh, listening booth. Check out my shit. band. Yeah. Just walk up and put headphones on people, that kind of thing. <laughs> just hustling our asses off. And then it all kind of fell in place to the point where Feldman said, I want to work on some songs with you and take you guys to showcase for Maverick. Wow. So he came to the house in Orange County in our rehearsal space that we built in the garage. Uh, that I'm sure the landlord didn't know about and helped us kind of like do really quick and dirty pre-production on songs to kind of trim stuff up or trim it down rather for the, the showcase. So he took our songs and said, you're going to play these in four days, but now this is the way you're going to play them. Like tore up the arrangements, the whole kind of thing we did until the day I die. We did razor blades, I think. And then some other songs that didn't, you know, didn't make it to the story of the year album. But we ended up showcasing for Maverick at the Viper Room. This was October 20 or 2002. Yeah, huh. October 2002. No, it, it would have been September because we signed in October. So we played in September, got the offer. I mean, like on the way home, we got a call from Feldman. We were all in the van. He said, hey, Maverick's going to make an offer today. You're going to get a, a document. You're going to get a contract to look over. You need a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And it just happened like, like just so fast. It was terrifying because, you know, ev everything we had ever heard from any band was you don't take your first offer. You know, you uh -huh. weigh out your options. And, you know, this is coming from bands in scenes, you know, they're showcasing right. a dozen times kind of thing. But it was the only offer we had. It was decent. It was small. I mean, like tiny by 2002 standards. Uh huh. Pretty big by today's standards. I mean, we got like a thirty thousand dollar advance. We got a an equipment budget. Uh, they were going to pay for a bunch of videos and shit. But since it was small by those days standards, the argument was, well, they're not going to give you a ton of money up front. So uh -huh. either you do really well and you make a bunch of money. Or you do okay, and they don't drop you because it's not like they, they've they wasted a bunch of money and they need to cut their losses. Yeah, you weren't a huge investment as far as right. the, that went. Yeah, so it being Maverick, you know, we knew of Maverick from Madonna and the Deftones. Right. So we were like, shit, this is a great label with artists that we 
care about. It's under Warner. We were we would have our album produced by this dude whose band we love, who is kind of mentoring us, and we already had this relationship. It just seemed after we got over the anxiety of it, it seemed kind of like a no brainer. So we signed in October of 2002 and started working on music like kind of right away. I think November and December, mid-November into like right before Christmas, we did Until the Day I Die, Razor Blades, and Anthem of Our Dying Day. Wow. And then finished the rest in early 2003 and the rest is history. Oh my gosh. That's incredible that um, that you guys were able that, that uh, you know, you, you meet John Feldman and it's one of those things where kind of like what the used did just kept giving them CDs. Like you guys yeah. just, you know, shove one in the van, but you had a videotape, which makes it even better. Cause it's yeah. like, it's just such a different w- approach. And he was probably like, Oh, what the hell? You know, cause like a VHS, you probably hadn't exactly. gotten many of those before. Right. And then you track his attention and you know, the bands that he's produced and the success that he's had is insane. I mean, even to this day. Um, and I love the warp tour story, just having somebody kind of be a sponsor. And then you set up, I've, uh, I've talked to a couple other artists that have had that kind of luck. Like, um, I think mod son was one. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Nick from the band girlfriends, he, mm-hmm. he did that when he was rapping, like set up some fake company and just, you know, w- yeah. rapped on this little stage you built and you're getting the same you know people are walking around especially if you're a band they're like oh wow there's another yeah you know stage set up right here <laughs> what's funny is like rappers like that and mod son who it like same kind of thing such a hustler you know worked with feldman as well ryan uh-huh. and i interviewed that dude 10 years ago for a documentary that we made before he was doing anything oh uh, oh yeah I, I did read that you had a documentary about the music industry yeah and it's so funny that like it took like the scene evolving to get to a place where it wasn't just bands, you know, like solo artists like that could could do things to gain the system in new ways. Because I think that we single handedly fucked up everyone's opportunity to to do what we were doing because we were so dumb. Like we should have been low key with everything. We should have tried to be under the radar, but instead we didn't just play on that 10 by 10 stage that we used that as a drum riser and the whole area in front was the stage. Like, <laughs> and we had wirelesses. We had all this gear. The, the generator was, you know, we were flipping breakers on the generator, like every other song. Cause we just had too much shit. We had a giant inflatable gorilla, a blue gorilla <laughs> that a friend of ours stole from a car dealership that we blew up behind the tent. So we had all this shit attracting all this attention. And Kevin Lyman had to be like, God damn it, I'm we're changing rules next year. You know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah. Because so you had already had the contract or he was already let you guys do it. Yeah. So he couldn't stop you at that point. I guess, dude. But we were like, we were just and the same thing with like uh CDs and you know, kind of force feeding music to people. We were the only band doing that in two thousand two. And the next year, I mean just dozens, everybody doing all the same shit. So we I don't want to say that we single-handedly started any of those trends, but we we were at like the inflection point where stuff was starting to get out of hand. <laughs> yeah, like, you guys were, you know, early adapters to that, early, you know, people doing that. Because now, or even after that, it became this thing. Yeah. And to, even to this day, you could walk. I lived in San Francisco for a while, and there'd be people on the street all the time. Like, Check out my de- my mixtape, and it's like, yeah, okay, like. I'm just trying to get to work, man. Like, or exactly. whatever, you know, we used to do that shit at malls too, dude. We would go to the, uh, the block at orange and just walk around and just harass people with our <laughs> disc man and headphone set up and, you know, our backpacks full of CDs. And we would like, we would actually buy the CDs from ourselves. So we get them printed. And as individuals, I'd say, you know, I would say I can sell 10 CDs this week. So I'd buy 10 CDs from our band at cost. And I would have to go make the money back, you know? Oh. So we like incentivized ourselves by having this weird little like pyramid scheme <laughs> internally. Yeah, you know? Amongst yourselves. Yeah. Wow. That's really fascinating. So then, I mean, get this deal. Like you remember calling back to your family and being like, oh my, you know, we signed with Maverick, like especially your mom who has yeah. always been really, really supportive of it. Like that must've been a big moment for you. Yeah. I, 
the thing I remember most is not not telling my mom. I actually don't remember that specifically. I mean, I remember her being very excited and very proud and, you know, the old, like, I knew it, I knew it, honey, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But uh, telling my dad was the best part of it because, again, he was very skeptical. Uh -huh. But when we moved, I came to him with, like, a, a legitimate plan. Here's what we're doing. Here's the time we're going to spend. Here, here's what we've done so far. Here's the outlook and so on. And he said, okay, well, I think this is the longest of long shots I've ever heard of, but you have a plan and you're smart and I trust you. So wow. we went out and did it. And then when we got signed, being able to call him and tell him that that was happening was, was pretty gratifying, you know, very validating. That's so amazing. That's such a cool story. Like with, with, with that, it didn't seem like you were there very long before stuff started to happen either when you moved to LA right? or when you were in Orange County or were you there for a couple of years before signing? In total, recording everything, we were there for one year. Wow. Yeah. And that's including Feldman and, and recording the record and everything and signing yeah. the deal. Yeah. Jeez, because that's quick. We were on tour in less than a month because we already had Warp Tour booked, you know, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that thing. And I think Goldfinger was immediately after it or maybe right before it. And then once we started working with Feldman, I think we did some more shows even before the album came out. So ev everything just went into full speed within that year. And since Feldman lived up in Marina Del Rey, we would just drive up for the uh -huh. recording from Orange County every day, five people in a Honda Civic, <laughs> back and forth, you know, two, three hour commute all yeah. together. And um, at the end of it, we were going to go on tour. So we only moved home because we had no need for a house anymore. Right. There's no need to pay rent on some place that you're never going to be. At. Yeah. So we just dropped all of our earthly belongings at our parents' houses and just went out on the road. Oh my gosh. And then that album does incredibly well. I mean, it, it's a platinum record, which is unbelievable. And yeah. when you, when you, when it comes out and things are starting to happen, like you're getting commercial success, um, getting played on the radio, you had videos, like, I mean, all of that to happen on that first album, what was that like? Was that overwhelming? I mean, you had, you said you had anxiety going into it, going into just signing the deal, but then having it work out. Yeah. Was that like an added pressure or was it, were you just kind of living in the moment? What was that like? The biggest pressures to us were in retrospect, a complete waste of our energy. So our biggest thing was, because it happened so fast, we were, we were most freaked out and anxious about, about blowing up too fast and being perceived as this overnight kind of thing, rather than a band who's put in their time, paid their dues, touring and, and, and whatnot, like, you know, all the hardcore bands that we felt like we needed uh, the, the approval of. Right. So the idea of our single coming out before the album was like, what? Like, we're just gonna, like a radio band? Are you shitting me? You know, like we, we wanted to go grind it out and play shitty, you know, beer and piss smelling clubs for five years before anything really happened because we thought that was the only way we could be credible and all this shit that is irrelevant now. Right. So every step of the way, it was, you know, worrying about the cred police coming to knock on our door for not being <laughs> hardcore enough. <laughs> yeah. And it's weird. I, at the same time, I had this thing where every, every, you know, step of the ladder up, I just wanted personally to, to see the next thing because I came into the band knowing that something was going to happen, knowing that we were going to make it in some way. Not because I, I was, you know, arrogant about my own abilities. It's because I, from the outside, looked at this band as this is the band that's going to succeed. So I kind of, I, really took everything for granted in a lot of ways not in not in the sense that i didn't care but in the sense that i didn't take the time in the moment to really absorb how significant it was i was always thinking about what was next hmm. and that was with radio that was with tours that was with everything i was like cool this is great let's not sit around and jerk ourselves off let's see what's next you know and keep pushing and 
that that applied in some ways helpfully and in some ways not so helpfully um i guess like i could make a million examples of of things just bad decisions we made because we assumed we would just continue to grow mm-hmm. you know i mean i remember specifically vividly saying to my ex-wife yeah so next album you know cuz it'll be twice as big or whatever um we'll we'll just be we'll be able to have this and we can get this and then we're gonna have two buses because we're gonna have all this staging shit we're gonna have fucking fire shoot not a shit and we're gonna be goddamn metallica essentially yeah. um but it didn't work out that way so on one side i'm thinking that we're just gonna keep growing and keep becoming this whatever the hell version of us we wanted to be and everyone's gonna love it regardless and on the other side when the singles are really crushing and management and the label wants to take the songs to top 40 radio because that was then possible. Mm -hmm. We fought it fucking tooth and nail. We we, we refused to let our songs go to top 40 radio because we thought we would be perceived as like sellouts or we wouldn't be in perceived the way we wanted to be in the scene. It's funny how that is now. Cause like I always, I've talked to other artists where it's like the selling out was like the worst thing you could ever do. Yeah. It was green day sold out. And it's like, well, yeah, and then they sold millions upon millions of records, and they're they still sp- doing it. Yeah, yeah. They spend their entire lives being musicians. As a result. right, exactly, exactly. But it was like this whole thing. There's just like this stigma to it, and now it's like every kid in the world wants to sell out. They want to have that yeah. viral TikTok video or get that late, get that deal or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. really, it's just a fascinating shift in the whole industry. Yeah. Um. But wow. Yeah, dude. Well. I want to talk to you about your new record and I don't want to keep you for too long either. And I thank you so much for, for doing this dude. Like this has been so cool. And to think about, you know, you, you the, that record came out what, 20 years ago. New. Yeah. I mean, to still be doing this and still be putting out albums. I mean, that just says something about the band and the longevity you guys are able to keep. It's crazy. Thanks man. It's not it's a lot definitely of definitely not something we expected. You know, I, yeah. I, we always talked about the idea of doing this in our forties seemed strange or even embarrassing you know doing backflips <laughs> and flipping out on stage but here we are and none of us can imagine ever stopping really i love it man well yeah so the new record is incredible i i was listening to it earlier i love how you just in the first song it's cause you come out with an acoustic it's like acoustic guitar and i'm like whoa this is awesome and then yeah. it obviously gets super heavy um when did you guys start working on this record you know t- kind of tell me about this was it different approach i mean you had the pandemic and all the other stuff that happened in the midst of you know the two uh, wolves in this one yeah a lot of stuff was going on well the writing never really stops ever ryan is just incapable of turning off that part of his brain so he he had been making demos since you know a couple months after wolves was done he was already back into writing and taking leftovers and adding to it and just generating this giant pile of demos and potential songs. And Dan would throw vocals on something, you know, whatever kind of like caught his attention, you know, we get an idea here or there. And that, that batch of songs started to grow, but what became the album really came from like digging through that and finding a few things. Once we, once we met Colin, and and decided that he was going to be the dude who was going to make the album. I can't remember. I feel like it was spring. God, so it would have had to... It could have been two years ago. It took a long damn time. So we got together with him. We kind of picked through some songs, and then we worked on our own for a while and scheduled some, some studio time to go down to Nashville. Oh, you recorded we, in Nashville? Yeah. Colin had moved from L.A. to Nashville not long before that, bought a house. He awesome. Bought, um, I recently moved to Nashville a couple of years ago oh, from word. San Diego. Yeah, I love oh, it. Nice. Yeah, he, he bought a house that had been owned by um, one of Dwight Yoakam's engineers. Oh, which, wow. It has a studio in the back. So um, we were working in the studio with, um, well, actually, before we did that, we, we went out to L.A., Ryan and Dan before me, and then I went out and met them working with a bunch of different writers, partially to get some potential songs and 
partially as just like an exercise. Colin wanted us to get out of the old mindset of having to write everything ourselves and just open up to collaborating. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of that and some really good stuff came out of it. But it was once we sat down with Colin and took all of Ryan's old demos, some of Dan's, a bunch of garbage that I made, and then all these songwriting demos started picking through and finding parts that we liked, parts that he saw potential in, and then writing with him as well as like a fifth band member, really. He like fully got in hands-on and we spent almost a full year writing, demoing, going back and forth, adding and, and building it up to this point where we finally had an album. And it was a whiteboard that we, we kept looking at thinking, okay, well, we need a song like this, or we're missing this kind of dynamic or whatever. So it was just, it was this long, slow, but, you know, steadily progressive prog uh, process of, of forming what, what felt like the rightful successor to Page Avenue, what felt like the, the album that should be you know, I mean, the goal was really to make the sequel to Page Avenue for 2023, mm -hmm. you know, for 2022. And I think we fully achieved that. It, w it was very calculated in a way, but not in a contrived way. It just, it happened so organically, which is a word that I don't love, but it's probably the best word for it because we would just, like vibe out with Colin and other writers that would come in and just roll with ideas that felt good. And some things just fell into place and some things we toiled over, but it was all about like what felt the best. Yes. We said, Oh, we need a song like this. We need a song like this, but not from a, like a commercial standpoint. It was like, we were always thinking of dynamics, whether it's a live set or the sequence of an album. You know, like our, the first song on Page Avenue, we've opened the show with that song 80% of our shows that we've ever played because wow. dynamically it does the right thing. You know what it's, I mean? Yeah. We come out with that, that energy and that momentum, and then we settle into something else. Maybe it's bouncier, and then we come down to something like Anthem of Our Dying Day, and you got your peaks and valleys. So as we're looking at this whiteboard, we're thinking – man, we really need a song with something like this tempo, you know, and we're just, we're all kind of like thinking in that sense. And um, it really just, it was like, it was like we were writing the script as we were shooting the movie, I guess is the way to put it. I'm always yeah. thinking visual terms. Interesting. With like, I mean, you probably didn't have as much pressure of, okay, it needs to get out. Like, right. I don't know. I mean, because you had so many years Cause you were, you left the band for a little while and then you came back and mm -hmm. you hadn't put a record. Did you play on wolves or that was, that was the album? No, I joined like rejoined after, after that one. Out. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then it's like, there was even seven years, six, seven years in between that album and what you guys just released. So it's like, probably not a lot of like, okay, this album, we just put this out and it did really well. We got to jump on this next thing. It was right. like, you know, there was a lot more space in between the album. Plus, you know, the pandemic oh, allows some more time. <laughs> yeah, the way, the way it just completely distorts our perception of time is crazy to think. I mean, you saying six or seven years, that, that certainly is a fact. And goddamn, that's weird to think about. I know. You know? It's, it's, I can't believe it's 2023. That's still just like, doesn't, I can't wrap my head around that. Yeah. So, the, I mean, the idea was to take the time to make the best album possible and not rush it. And then when it came to the release schedule, since we had been out for so long and Wolves was self-released with different management, our perception of like how an album should roll out and how singles and all that go was severely outdated. So when the label and management came out, came to us and said, okay, we're, we're, we're thinking in like March and we're like, okay, March of 2023, like next year. And they're like, yeah, so we'll do this, you know, we'll do a single a month, essentially, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, what? <laughs> but it made the most sense. And, you know, their points were like, you know, you can either drop it all at once 
everyone can listen to all of it and forget about it in a week. Or you can kind of take, you know, like a hybrid approach of what pop and hip hop artists do releasing singles and what rock bands do. And instead of releasing a bunch of singles and not have an album, you release a bunch of singles that lead to an album. Mm -hmm. And that made a lot of sense to us. Oh yeah, totally. Cause then, then you're not, yeah, it's, it's basically a hybrid of the two instead of, cause a lot of, uh, I've noticed that the new thing is like, we'll release four songs as singles and then the fifth one. And now it's an EP. It's like, well, it seems like you've already really given away the whole thing beforehand. So with that approach, it's like, okay, here's three or four songs. And then, but now you get six, seven more, which I think is a cool concept. And, and since you got, I mean, the fact that you can still put albums out is incredible. There's not a lot of bands can start off. I mean, starting out now, it's hard to, put a full album together get anyone to care but since you i mean the longevity of your band and those fan bases you guys have acquired over the years is is really impressive yeah and it's it's amazing i I feel so lucky so fortunate to have that base you know and to have people who still care and have people who still know the name even if they haven't kept up with us all along to be able to release music and remind them or reactivate the fans who do care and you know do that all around the world is amazing Mm -hmm. and it there is so much luck involved like i i I will never ever downplay or discount how hard we worked but for things to fall in place the the way they did we were extremely lucky you know there's no shortage of amazing bands who just never got the shot or never you know had that the crucial piece that that made it all come together it didn't have like the glue you know mm-hmm. so yeah i feel incredibly fortunate and i appreciate the shit out of the fans who have who stuck with us and have gotten to know us as people and we've gotten to know them as people and it, it makes the connection so much better you know th- this all happened in days pre-social media so it's it's that much more special i think yeah a hundred percent and it wasn't even like you guys came out and had the one single that did well because there's even a handful of bands in the genre that did that and then they went away right it's yeah to keep the fan base and to continually put out music that people care about and then 20 years later you're still doing that and and the record's incredible thanks dude it it feels really really good it's uh it's it's the kind of thing where when you're as old as we are uh no shade yes shade we're old as shit um, <laughs> it's hard to know if you love something because you just because you made it or because it's actually good or great. It's hard to, to step out, sometimes impossible to see yourself, see yourself in your art from an, an objective perspective. Mm-hmm. So it's incredibly validating to be this amped about an album and this confident in songs and then see them received as well as they've been received. And now radio play as well. War is, it's, it's like the, the number one song on our station at home. It's number 35 on active rock radio. I mean, this, this is like nothing that we ever expected. We gave up on trying to care about radio years ago, just in terms of expectations. Like we, we'd right. been, you know, pumped up and, and let down so many times. It's just not even on our radar. And then it happens and it's like, holy shit, I guess we, did do a bunch of things right i guess we did make a good album you know it's that's huge what a huge we don't validation. just love it because it's ours you know yeah had it been since um page avenue that you had a radio single or did you have a couple off the other albums we had a little play on the second album because it um you know we were still on maverick and yeah coming on the, the heels of that success a lot of stations you know they give well, the single a shot yeah, right yeah. out the gate regardless but I mean, maybe there was some international play here and there on our third album, but nothing on the fourth album. And Wolves didn't even get played on our local station. Oh, wow. There's some other factors in play there, but... Sure. Um, yeah, it, it's been so long that we, we just figured, okay, there are millions of bands in Earth's history that have never been played on the radio that have great careers. Right. Like... 90% of metal bands, for example. <laughs> I was going to say, the, radio isn't a, like a make it or break it. I, yeah. I worked in radio for 
17 years before oh, yeah. I, I really started to do this podcast and i've worked in alternative radio in san francisco and san diego and i've seen a million bands come through and just because you have a radio single i can name 15 bands off the top of my head that had one song that we played and then they're either probably not a band anymore or they're not nearly as successful as you guys are yeah and that's going back to you know being afraid of, of blowing up too fast that was our concern you know so that's why the, the main reason why we tried so hard to make our live show matter number one we we just we loved crazy energy you know energetic bands i mean going back to like hair metal bands all the way up through like modern hardcore at the time so we wanted to be one of those bands that didn't have to rely on radio success didn't have to rely on singles and could could impress people and and give people something on tour that they would never forget mm -hmm. so i think without that it would have been much different i mean we would have we would have persisted regardless because we're just those kind of people you know we're we're all good enough friends that we we managed to get along and remain a band for so many years but i think our live show is it's as much is it's as much a part of our longevity as anything yes it feels mm -hmm. i mean we're incredibly lucky to have a song like until the day i die that is like a classic in the genre now but i don't know there are a bunch of bands back in the day that had a song that just like you said aren't around anymore or can't sell any tickets you know and, or people show up to their shows and they're like damn this shit's boring <laughs> yeah or they're just waiting for the one song <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> like, yeah uh okay i'm gonna go out and grab a drink i'm gonna do this i haven't played that song yet yeah. um but dude thank you so much adam for doing this man i really appreciate your time today this has been so much fun awesome um, thanks for having me yeah and i love the fact that you guys are on the you know with amber lynn and the the yellow card tour and yeah all these like my the bands i loved growing up and, and going to see when i was like in high school and you know even like you know with the you see the when we were young lineup you guys you guys played that too and it's like yeah. oh my gosh it's so weird to see some of these it's not weird because they're amazing bands but to see some of the bands at the top and it's like god i remember seeing them in san diego at like 150 cap club and it wasn't even like a third full and now right. like this the genre is like just back and people are caring and, and and it's something to be said about the music and the, the songs and everything else and i uh i think it's awesome that you you guys are doing this tour with them as well it's surreal dude just to give you one final thought i, I remember being at when we were young and i was watching uh my friend nick ganbarian from bayside and i were watching paramore on uh -huh. the main stage and granted we were both a little high and a little drunk but we had this like amazing moment where we looked at each other and we were like thinking the same thing at the same time and both tried to say it at the same time. It was, it was like the most validating moment I've had in years when it comes to our band and our scene to see a band like Paramore who started out as these little kids, like these teenagers that were opening up for our bands to see them up there on a level that felt like I was watching fucking Phil Collins or something like, you know what I mean? Like all, all these extra musicians, all this insane production, these amazing hits, like timeless hits in front of 50,000 people or whatever. And Nick said to me, he's like, dude, that's us. This is us. Like, this is our scene. Our little dirty, sweaty, warped tour punk rock scene is, is this now for this generation of people. It's, fucking surreal you know it that kind of thing didn't happen to hardcore it didn't even really happen i guess it happened to new metal with like limp biscuit but like there are a lot of genres that don't get you know or scenes that don't get to that level so to be part of it and especially you know especially being part of like the early days that brought it to mainstream mm -hmm. is so incredibly validating it's so contrary to the, the all the cred police shit that we were worried about back in the day. And maybe that even makes it more special, but it's, um, God, it, it's amazing, dude. And then my chemical romance following them was goddamn unbelievable. Those dudes opened for us when they were just smelly little vampires and <laughs> they're up there just being the biggest band in the world. And I'm so happy for them and for all of us who, 
who are still part of this. Yeah, man, it's really cool. It's really incredible to see. And I, and I, I think that's awesome that you said just about, you know, just looking out there and knowing like, wow, we're a part of this. And like, it's such a big, like it's a nostalgia thing, but not, I, mean, but it, I don't know. It's, I don't, I hate that word too, but it's like all those bands, like I, if, if you told me, you know, this festival would be happening in 20, in 20 plus years and there's going to be 50,000 people there, I would have been like, what? Like bands that are signed to like victory records are going to be headlining this, you yeah. know, 50, it, it, like the whole, the whole concept and the cool thing about it, which I think it was such so much bigger than what anyone really assumed just because of the internet wasn't there at the time. It was like every town had their little scene kids. And yeah. then now it's just like everyone came together. I, it's just really cool, man. I, and I love that you guys are a part of it and, and still playing and still releasing music. Cause it, you guys are one of the, one of the earlier bands in the, in the genre that really made it and, and succeeded. So I think yeah, that's man. so awesome. Thank you. It feels it feels good. Yeah, dude. Well, I have one more question for you, and I appreciate your time again, Adam. Thank you so much. Um, I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh God. Um, all I can say is things will change. Success is a moving target. The path to success is a moving target. And that moving targets moving faster than ever because it's so much of it relies on technology and technology evolves at an accelerating rate right so we see like now social media platforms you know the the, the turnover is, is quick you know and people's attention span that turnover is quick so you hmm. so Given that, my the, the way I would have answered this 20 years ago is actually pretty similar. It comes down to knowing what you want. If you want to be a musician, be a musician. I, I wouldn't say totally give up on um, any other career aspirations. You know, don't, don't ditch any backup plan that you have. You know, I, I don't say that as fully as I used to, but the, the, the quote, this is a hilarious quote, or it's hilarious who I'm quoting. Rosie O'Donnell said, <laughs> <laughs> 20 years ago, I heard this quote, and it's so weird that this, this was the most motivating thing I ever heard. She said, if I would have had a backup, or if I would have had a fallback plan, I would have fallen back. So. If you want to be a musician, you want to be an artist, be a musician, be an artist, and put every bit of time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears you have into that. Just the same way you would if you want to be a doctor or you want to be a lawyer. I don't know many people that go to law school and also go to med school as a backup plan. They want to be a lawyer, so they go to law school. Treat your career as a musician or a creative of any kind that way. Of course, be smart. Try to learn from mentors, try to learn from, I mean, YouTube, <laughs> like learn, for, learn from all the, 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 the infinite resources that you now have to educate yourself on what you're doing and combine your passion with your intelligence and your work ethic to achieve your goals. And don't let anyone tell you, you can't do it. There's more opportunity now than there's ever been. Success has a million different variants. It's not like the old days where you have to get signed. Just, just don't stop until it happens. And if you get to a point where you feel like maybe you can't, maybe you're burned out and you can't go further, ask yourself how badly you want it. And maybe you don't. Maybe you want something else, and that's totally fine. But if you're still sure that you want it, just do not fucking stop until it happens. Bring me the best word.